Hey everyone, this is Joey Bushnell. Today I have with me a fantastic guest. He is the author of the world famous book, Work the System. His name is Sam Carpenter. Sam, thank you so much for being with me today. Glad to be here, Joey. Thanks. Sam, what is your book, Work the System, all about? Well, it is about taking a business that is chaotic and turning it into a calm, peaceful, profitable organism. It is an organism, uh, one way or the other. There are systems working and processes happening, and the question is, are those processes, are those systems being managed? And so this is for the small to mid-sized business owner, and uh, they can take the book, and it's actual, actually it's a step beyond Michael Gerber's book, The E-Myth, and then it shows you just what to do. It's not at all a copy of his book in the first instance, but it is. Uh, it does share the commonality of uh, working on your business rather than in your business, and uh, any business owner, without exception, <laughs> unless they're crazy, would like their business to be independent of them so they can like go on vacation <laughs> or get sick or whatever, and also be profitable and be a pretty much a money machine and a place you can go because you love to do what you do and you love the people you work with. And it doesn't demand that you be there 80 hours a week. So the book is about fixing that problem. So how did you come to write this book, Sam? Where were you in your life that prompted you that you've got to write this book? Well, I talk about it in the book, and my life history is one of chaos up to the age of 50. I'm 63 now. But at the age of 50, I had had this call center business, and just a, just a regular nuts and bolts business where we take incoming emergency calls for doctors and funeral homes and, and uh, half a dozen different uh, vertical markets of business where you want a human being to answer the phone. We take the incoming emergency calls and pass them on to the appropriate uh, emergency personnel for that particular business. Uh, we have about a thousand accounts. I had been running it since the age of 35, so for a decade and a half I had been running this business, which is so error prone. Uh, just here in the United States, not to mention the UK and the rest of the world, but just here in the US, we have about 2,000 competitors. And every one of them is chaotic because every account's different. There's so much that could go wrong. It's what I call a cauldron for chaos. And at 15 years, I was going to finally, absolutely, without question, miss a payroll. And if I missed the payroll, everybody would walk out. And despite myself, the business had grown over that decade and a half uh, about six times over. From I think we were doing 5,000 U.S. Uh, per month, and we were up to 30 or 35,000 a month. We had grown, but it was killing me physically, financially. I was the single parent of two kids. Uh, just barely enough to survive, and my physical health and my mental health was going downhill, and I was going to miss this payroll. So what happened was, uh, and there's a chapter in my book called you know, Gun to the Head Enlightenment, Gun to the Head Enlightenment. So I laid in bed one night, and I realized that I was going to absolutely lose the business, and why don't I just ask myself the question, what did I do wrong? <laughs> in all this time, and I didn't get an answer. I laid there in bed awake. I think I was awake, or maybe I was sleeping, or maybe I was halfway in between, but I got a vision of a table in this dream or semi-awake state, a table in front of me, and all the pieces of my business were laid out on the top of that table, and there were two very important insights I got from that vision that night. One was that they were separate. The pieces were separate from each other. They were not connected even though I had this business called Centratel, and, and Centratel is a, a, a collection of, of things that go on, uh, these things that went on were separate from each other, and they weren't just objects in my dream. They were uh, objects as processes. And what I realized that night was my business in my entire life, of course, and we're getting down to real mechanical reality, if my business is a certain way, probably my life is that way too, uh, every part of my life, every part of my business was not a big conglomeration of sight, sounds, and events, but was actually a collection of independent systems and processes. And that night, 
And that was 13 years ago. That night I realized that my business was a collection of independent processes and the logical thing to do would be to pick the process out of the business that was the most problematic and fix it. Fix it with documentation. This came to me instantaneously. If I'm going to get all my people to do things the right way, I have them help me create the perfect way to do those things. And I talk about this extensively in the book. But what happened was I went down to the office. I found a way to make the payroll. I went down to the office the next day, found a way to make the payroll, and we fixed the biggest problem first and, and documented it. Sorry, boring but true, but on planet Earth, you have to document your processes if you ever want your business to grow, if you ever want to get out for being in the middle of it. And then we did the next process and the next process and the next process. The key here was that I saw my business was not something that could be fixed by another loan or a consultant or the hand of God, or I would take some magic pill that would... Uh, get me to do everything right all of a sudden. What I needed to do was just take my business apart because mechanically that's what it is, is, is a collection of parts. It's a primary system that is a collection of subsystems. And take each subsystem apart, fix it, document it, so it's performed. You know, most of our businesses are the same thing happening over and over again, what I call recurring systems, recurring processes. So what we wanted was we wanted every process to be executed perfectly or close to perfectly 100% of the time. And what would you have? I asked myself that night. This was great. I asked myself that, that night, and I, I can still feel my insecurity in this question. What would happen if all these pieces in my business, what, what if I could get them all to execute perfectly 100% of the time? Would I have a perfect business? And I honestly, 13 years ago that night, didn't know the answer to that question. And I'm here to tell you that if you have all the uh, components of your business working perfectly and you have a direction, and that's easy to establish and you have some goals, if you have all the parts working perfectly, you will have a perfect business. So I was working 80 to 100 hours a week. Now I work two hours a week. My net income is, well, my gross and my net income is approximately 30 times what it used to be. So it's a, it's a great way to go. And I highly recommend that our listeners take a look at their lives, their businesses and their lives, and see that they are truly a collection of separate processes. And, and just let me finish up by saying, when you see your business, for example, as a collection of separate processes, it gets real easy to fix things if you're willing to fix the pieces one at a time. That's where I spend all my time. And the people we consult to, I have a consulting operation, international consulting operation, and the coaching and the book and the uh, online product we have, it all goes back to being able to see the world as a collection of processes and then going after them one, one after the other. It's, it's not rocket science. It's just simple, uh, a simple methodology that you do over and over again, and it, it works. Brilliant. So we can see that it works, Sam. So what are the consequences of, because a lot of the, the, the people listening to this are small business owners like myself, what are the consequences of failing to get systems in place? What, what's likely to happen? What is absolutely likely to happen if you don't get documented systems in place is you will never grow past a certain point. You can't. And the other thing, the other consequence is, now you're an artist in a sense, Joey, and I am too to a degree and all of our listeners out there have a special talent that they do. But you've got to find a way to extricate yourself from the machinery of the everyday world if you want to grow. And the way you do that is you work with your people, you document things, and you train other people to do what you do. Now, uh, you need to do these interviews, Joey, you know, and I need to do my writing and so forth. But 90, 99% of what everybody out there does can be done by other people even very creative things. So you're going to limit your growth. You're going to be in the middle of things all the time. You're going to go crazy. You're not going to have a personal life, and you're not going to ultimately have much money because there's a million other people out there doing the same things. And I'll, I, I, this is a bold thing to say, but I'm absolutely confident that nine out of ten of our listeners are, out there are in a little bit of chaos with what they do or a lot of chaos. 
Nine out of ten businesses are small businesses are mismanaged in the sense that the owner is doing everything because they somehow think they have magical powers and they're the only one that can do it. And they're not thinking about the processes. Now let me let me do one thing, and if this was a if this was a video, I would show this. I'll try to illustrate that in everybody's head, the listener, our listeners out there. But imagine uh, imagine a flip chart, and I'm talking, and I'm going to write this on the top of the flip chart. The letter one over on the left side, with an arrow going to the right to the left to the number two, number two, and then an arrow going over to the number three, and an arrow going over to a number four, and then an equal sign on the right side of the numeral four an equal sign, and then to the right of the equal sign, the word result. Okay, so one leads to two, two leads to three, three leads to four, and, and then th I'm just doing four steps. There could be 10,000 or there could be two steps. Usually there's somewhere, you know, 10 to 50 steps in a, in a typical business process. Most people don't realize that the results over on the right-hand side don't have anything to do with their IQ, their wonderful personality, their heroic willingness to work 80 hours a week, their smile on their face, their good looks, whatever. It has to do with the process. And that's why people who we, don't, we, we just know aren't that smart can have a lot of money and have a lot of freedom. Or somebody with a horrible personality has a lot of time and has a lot of freedom, has a lot of money, uh, because they're spending their time over in the one to two to three to four part working on the systems that equal the results. Most people are over on the right side, and I would circle the word result right now if I was at the flip chart. They're shuffling around the bad results of unmanaged systems. In other words, the one, two, three, four part over on the left side of the equation. So, my insight that night, and what I tell everybody, no matter what forum I'm using, is you need to spend your time working the processes, hence the title of the book, Work the System, and the subtitle, of course, is The Simple Mechanics of Making More and Working Less. You need to spend your whole day over there on the left side of the equation making the systems better and better and better. And if you do that, and again, there's a little bit of documentation at the beginning about uh, direction and goals and how you make decisions and so forth, very simple stuff. As long as you do that and then you spend all your time over working on the systems, the results will take care of themselves. Does that make sense? I makes, hope I explained that okay. Makes absolute perfect sense, Sam. And so uh, I guess what you're saying there is there's no respect of, of persons here. It doesn't matter if you're clever and you've got a lovely personality. Basically, if you're not getting these systems in place, you're going to have a really hard time. <laughs> if you don't spend your time working the systems, you're never going to get the results you want. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, uh, Richard Branson, Oprah Winfrey, uh, some of the big names that everybody knows out there, that's what they're good at. They just naturally know how to work their systems. They have other people do the documentation and so forth, but they're finger pointers and implementers, and they see precisely that they need to work on the processes and the systems of their lives to get the results they want. They, the results just come spontaneously. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a big one to measure, well, we want to do these, this, these many dollars next year in sales. You know, I hear that all the time. You've got to have a plan for how much you're going to make and, and where you're going to be. You know, that's nonsense because you have to, what you have to do is find a way to spend your time working on the processes, and those numbers will be there, whatever they are. Uh, I'm not a big balance sheet kind of a guy. I'm an income statement kind of a guy as far as financials go. I spend very little time looking at numbers. All I do is work on the processes. And my call center here where I'm talking to you, Joey, here in Oregon, USA, uh, I my processes have to do with my people and having short meetings with them, and them coming to me, and they use me as a resource. But my people create all the processes. I don't do any documentation anymore. I just make sure the machine is headed in the right direction, and it doesn't get off track. That's my job. And, and so I spend two hours a week down here. I spend more than that in my office here, but it's just hanging out and bothering people mostly. <laughs> or, or doing an interview like this with you, which has nothing to do with my call center. Sure. And then I have the six other businesses that are related to the book, and I do a lot of creative stuff. I never do the same thing twice, Joey. The closest thing I come to doing...
the same thing twice as an interview, this interview with you. And I, as we talked about before the interview, I, I decline most of them and I don't do a lot of speaking engagements because I have other things I want to do that are first thing, the, 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 the things I've, I've never done before that, that I want to do in, in a creative way. My whole day is one creative day, and the people who work with me are that way, too. Hey, in fact, let me interject a little advertisement. If our listeners go to workthesystem.com, down in the lower right-hand corner of that front page is a thing that says, there's a little icon there that says, Work the System Testimonials. And click on that. I had some fun with it with my IT guy. I put it to music. <laughs> who does who does that? But that gives our listeners an idea of the change in life that a person can have if they start living in the processes rather than uh, you know shuffling around the bad results of unseen processes. There's hundreds of testimonials there, and they, they'll all go down the same road I'm going down here so far this morning with you, Joey. This changes. This changes lives and uh, gives a, a life a whole new trajectory upwards of uh, freedom and money. Brilliant. I'll put my testimony on, on there as well, actually, Sam. I didn't know that that was there, but I can say for myself that my life changed after reading the book as well. I used to get things outsourced, but on a small scale, I try and just in this kind of this mindset of, oh, I, you know, I can't afford to do it at that level um, and employ someone full time, that kind of a thing. You know, thinking quite small, basically, and and I realised, you know, after reading the book, what I really needed to do, and um, things really picked up when I started getting help, getting systems in place. So, like you said, I, I just think it's it's impossible to grow when you're trying to do it all on your own. It, it just can't happen. So my next question, Sam, was in the book you talk about three stages of the work the system method. Could you let us know what those three stages are, please? Sure, and uh, let me put those in a little different configuration than I've done before just for the fun of it. Sure. Uh, the first stage would be documentation and uh, we have three documents. One's a strategic objective. It's all explained in the book. Uh, and that is what, what you do, how you do it, generally how you're going to get where you want to go, what you don't want to get involved with, what your strengths are. And that's a single page, a single typewritten page. And then the second document is actually a series of items and ours is called here at Centratel is called the 30 principles. And that's what we call, another term for that is guidelines for decision making. In other words, when you're faced with a what I call a gray area decision, you don't really have a, de a definite answer for it, how do you decide? Mm -hmm. Well, these principles uh, that I came up with, and all these documents came to my head that night, these principles are how I believe the world mechanically works and what works best. And I always use this illustration. One of the principles is to do it now. Well, a new employee comes in here and they say, why, I could do it next Thursday. And we say, no, if you can do it now or next Thursday, do it now. And they say, why? And I say, well, first of all, that's the way we do things around here. <laughs> and I'm giving you money to do things the way we do them. Uh, but more importantly, uh, more importantly, that's what works best. Sam Carpenter believes that doing things now is a better way to go nine out of ten times. And so we have different things. Oh, we have another one. Uh, I'm just pop. These are popping in my head now. One is in the office, no rats' nests, literally or figuratively. So nobody has a cluttered desk, and there's it's clean and it's you know. And so these things that I believe I've written down and have incorporated in here. And people who come to work here look at those, and I say, do you agree with these pretty much? And 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 if they do, great, we're good to go. And I, and I always say, if you want to adjust any of these or add to them, talk to me, <laughs> even with a strategic objective. Okay? Mm -hmm. But so we've got a directional document. We've got a guidelines for decision-making. And then where we spend most of our time with a consulting account, for example. We're working with a $50 million company right now. And we're just finishing up our six-month gig. We're done. They're on their own. And what we've helped them with most of the time we were there was with this third set of documents called working procedures. Most people call them SOPs, uh, Standard Operating Procedures, written documentation of the various processes. So everybody's on board. And guess what? In, these, in the, this, this very intensive documentation of working procedures, we use a bottom-up philosophy where the people who actually 
do the procedures and execute the procedures are the act, actually the ones writing them up and making them work. And then you've got total buy-in. So that's the first stage, okay? Mm -hmm. And then the uh, second, okay, the, the first stage, the first stage, let me back up early, the first stage is getting this mindset. The second stage would be the documentation, all right? Mm -hmm. And then the third stage would be maintenance, all right? So you get this tweak in your head that your life is a collection of systems. Then, number two, you do the documentation. And then, number three, you maintain the processes and you spend all your time in the processes. So I, this was a little ad hoc, Joey, and I got my step two. Uh, I talked about step two first. But, but those would be the three steps in the work the system process right there, however convoluted I pre presented them to you. Sure. Well, uh, is it enough, Sam, to just have these in your head or what is the power in actually documenting these things? Well, you get, first of all, there's that bottom up thing mm -hmm. uh, with your front line people. I'm presuming, presuming a business with uh, two or three or four people in it or more, of course, mm -hmm. uh, is that you have your people completely bought in. You're not, it's not a military top-down thing where here you're going to do these 10 steps on this process no matter what well guess what they're not going to <laughs> they're just not going to in most cases mm -hmm. but if they create those 10 steps and then the manager authorizes them as being okay and everybody agrees they're going to be brutal about making sure those steps are followed and and remember uh and i haven't said this yet but always remember that if somebody's executing a documented process and they see a better way of doing step five, for example, mm -hmm. out of a 10-step process, they can go back to the manager and the manager will immediately make that tweak. So the working procedure of the SOP is a living thing. It changes day to day to day. It's not a military top-down thing. So you've got your total buy-in by your people. And the other thing you've got, Joey, is that everybody's doing things the same way. And I go back to my little narration of my life story, and that is uh, you want every process in your business executed perfectly 100% of the time. Mm -hmm. So I use the example of the front desk. So somebody's at the front desk answering the incoming calls. Uh, a possible new client calls in, I want to talk to the salesperson about whose service. Well, Mary might answer the phone one way, and if Mary's busy, maybe John will answer the phone, and he'll answer it a different way. And maybe John's got a hangover tomorrow, and when he answers it, he won't answer it very, very well, or he'll answer it ad hoc. So what if you could get the phone answered at the front desk? Remember, potential clients. And our potential client is a sixteen to $20,000 sale here, uh, over a period of six years, uh, what if the phone was answered perfectly every time a new person called in for service? Do you think that maybe we would end up closing more deals? Oh, yeah, we yeah. would. And then you do that all through your business. Centratel has about 400 different processes, and we execute all those processes as near perfectly as we can 100% of the time. That's why we've got a huge margin. That's why I can run seven businesses instead of just this one. And I and on this primary business, the one I write the book about, I wrote the book about, uh, I work two hours a week. It runs itself, mm -hmm. and everybody in here gets it. So step one, that step one of getting it is critical for the owner and the staff. And there will be staff turnover. Uh, as a company grows to find the correct people that do see things in this way, see things as separate systems and are a little bit nitpicky about details and aren't afraid of doing documentation. You've got to get the right people. We do drug testing. We're ruthless about our drug testing. I get all kinds of arguments about that. Well, it's my life. I can smoke dope if I want. No, actually, you're a part of the process here, and we need you to be clear thinking. And if you want to smoke dope, go up to the sandwich shop up here and earn $7 an hour, $8 an hour, and make sandwiches. Or you can come here and earn $20 an hour and not smoke dope. <laughs> so every element of our business has to do with perfecting the processes including uh, everybody's ability to think. And the result is we don't have any turnover here. Everybody is very highly paid. We're just examining the processes all the time. And it might sound militaristic. I'll use that word again, but it's not that at all. If you were walking my office, it's kind of a fun place to be. Everybody likes being here. 
people have their ups and downs, of course, but there's very little turnover. There's very little stress. There's no stress in the office, and nobody works over 40 hours. We don't have any of our middle managers working 80 hours a week. Nobody works 80 hours a week. 35 to 40 hours a week is the number one answering service in the United States of 2,000 competitors measured on a variety of of uh, very objective scales, including profitability, uh, uh, it makes for a beautiful, synchronized sewing machine of a business, and the owner doesn't have to be there. I mean, what, what more could you want as a business owner? Absolutely. So my next question, Sam, was why is delegation so important, and do you have any advice for us as to efficiently delegating tasks? Sure. Uh, the owner, the manager of the business should think three words on every decision that's made as they convert their business to a work system business to an efficient business. Can I, with this task, automate it, delegate it, or discard it altogether? And so most tasks you can't automate. Some tasks you can discard. That leaves most of the tasks to be delegated to other people, and I've already gone through the thing with how you can make that happen efficiently. You need to document. Boring but true, you need to document your processes and delegate stuff away, and that's what I've managed to do. And I'm, you know, looking down from 40,000 feet, if I had to really summarize things, I've, I've found a way to delegate my expertise downward so other people can do it, and I don't have to do it anymore. How can we make the, the most out of our own personal time? Well, now let's go back to step one of getting it. And part I, my book is three parts, coincidentally. The first part is getting it. So what our listeners can do right now is look around the room they're in or in the car they're in, wherever the, or if they're walking or whatever, and see the separate systems. Okay, that's, that's the thing to do with your personal time right now. Right this minute, listening to this audio – Look around. Okay, I'm looking around my room. There's a copier here. There's the monitor here. There's a chair over there. There's the light switch on the wall. And those are all separate from each other. They have nothing to do with each other. If somebody walks in the front door here, it has nothing to do with how somebody answers the phone in the back room. They're completely separate. And what, so what our listeners need to do right now, oh, walking down the street, there's a tree. There's a hydrant, a fire hydrant. Water hydrant. I don't know what you call it in the UK. Sorry. Yeah, but, probably fire hydrant. <laughs> okay, there's a. There used to be phone booths. <laughs> I'm, thinking, I'm thinking of the big red, red uh, metal and glass phone booth. Uh, but there's cars. There's the dog. You know, there's a power line under the street or overhead. All those things have nothing to do with each other. They just exist in your world as separate. They're all connected because you're seeing them all at the same time, but they're separate. So you go in your business, and as soon as you can see the separate processes of your business, the rest of it comes naturally. So if you're asking me, what can I do with my time, the best use of my time right now, that's what you can do. Download the book, read part one, and get the separateness, and then it'll all make sense. You almost don't even need the rest of my book once you get the separateness of your business and of your life, because that's a fact, that's a mechanical fact. We want to think we're all one and everything's connected. And I'm sure on an atomic level we are, but that's useless information. Uh, once you can start segregating your life into the separate components that it is, you can start to fix those separate components, one after the other after the other. And ultimately your time will be spent uh, working on those separate processes 100% of the time, except for the artsy fun part, like, Joey, I know you like to interview people, and I like to give interviews, and I like to – uh, right, and, and we do certain recurring things, but 95% of our time uh, should be on one-time creative system improvement tasks. And system improvement is a great phrase to carry around 12 inches in front of your face all day long. System improvement, system improvement, system improvement. That's where we should be spending our time. If we're doing this right, Sam, like you said, you've got a two-hour work week, which is kind of the dream for most people. So I guess the rest of the time you're enjoying yourself. I am. Yeah. So I've got a friend this afternoon. We're going to go do some climbing. Great. And I had the decision this morning to drive my new car, my old climber, beater climber car, what I call it. <laughs> I took my climber car. I went out and had some coffee with another friend. I'm doing this interview with you. And you remember... I said, hey, you said, when can we fit this in? And I said, I don't care, anytime, <laughs> Joey. <laughs> and you, you kind of picked this time, I think. It didn't matter to me. 
Uh, and then I, I saw a movie last night, and I got a date Friday night, and on and on. I can do whatever I want with my time, the things I want to do. Here's something. Here's something, Joey. Let me talk about this very quickly because people find this interesting. So I run into a lot of people. Uh, so I'm a mountain climber, and I have climber friends who want to be guides, mountain guides. So I have a climber friend who's climbed Mount Rainier up here. It's a, it's a pretty tall peak in the Cascades, 300 times, okay, because he loves to climb. Mm -hmm. And i got to ask him, yeah, have you really enjoyed that? Has it really got you anywhere? And then there's amateur bicycle racers. I want, to, I want to go to the Tour de France. Well, maybe someday they'll go. Probably not. But then what? Right? And so people have these things they love to do, and they think they need to make it a vocation. That is a big mistake. So I love to mountain climb, but I realized I can set up a machine to provide me all the time and all the money I want to go anywhere in the world and mountain climb on my own time and not drag somebody up that's never been up the mountain before. That's not fun. <laughs> and it's not fun to work six hours a day on a bicycle saddle because you like to race bicycles. Mm -hmm. So I really caution people about narrowing the scope of what they can do with their lives to what they like to do. Mm -hmm. Because you, there's all kinds of interesting businesses out there, and not just Internet businesses, Joey, not just online stuff, but all kinds of crazy little businesses like an answering service or, or a, even a restaurant. Uh, there's all kinds of things out there that can be automated and made to be run on their own that become essentially an ATM, what we call an ATM over here. I don't know what you call them in the U.K., but, yeah. uh, you know, a money machine. And then go ride your bike. Go climb your mountains. Go have go watch movies all the time if you want to do that. Uh, and I, I really caution to people to go, not to go down that, that road that seems to be in our culture uh, we should be able to do in our life what we love to do. You're just narrowing your prospects. Mm -hmm. but there's all kinds of opportunity out there uh, in businesses that can be fixed because I go back to what I said at the beginning, Joey. Nine out of ten businesses are mismanaged. Nine out of ten businesses have no bottom line and can be picked up for a song and a dance. That's how I bought this call center for nothing at all. I think I paid $21,000 for it. Uh, and five thousand dollars down back in late 1984. It's it's a five million dollar business right now. Uh, it's worth five million, and it has no debt. And and I love it for that reason. And I also love it that I only work two hours a week. It's a money machine. Brilliant. There's all all kinds of opportunity out there. Brilliant. And it's all thanks to getting your systems in place. The first 50 years of your life, Sam, the freedom that you now have just wasn't there. But when you got the systems in place, you've now got the time freedom to do what you want with your life, which is, like I said, for most people, that's just something, I guess it's almost a paradigm shift that most people don't even think is possible. But actually, it can be when the systems are in place. There's a lot of people out there doing this, and it has to do with mechanics. It has nothing to do with an emotion or how good looking you are, your IQ, and what I, the, the litany of items I went through before. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the machinery, which has no emotions, has no expectations. Is it running efficiently or not? That's the question. And it has nothing to do with if you're a good person or, or, or you go to church every day or anything like that. It has to do with is the machinery operating uh, properly. And this goes down to our listeners looking at their lives and you say, what mechanically works in your life? What mechanically happens? If you go down, if I go down to my car right now and I turn the key, will the motor of the car start? In all probability, it will. If I skip dinner tonight, will, will I be hungry at 10 o'clock? Yes, I will. There's certain things we know absolutely about our mechanical lives, and that's what we go back down to. And we get rid of all the emotions. The emotion's fine but not in what I'm talking about. And this all boils down to let's get the mechanics correct in our lives, and what we'll find is the happiness, emotional, satisfying part will come along naturally afterwards. And the paradigm, you mentioned the term paradigm, Joey, the paradigm most people have is I have to do the right things, I have to work hard, I have to get the right education, I have to have the right smile on my face, and then all the good things will come. No, actually you have to get the machine fixed and operating properly, and it's amazing when you have a lot of time and a lot of money, and you get to do creative stuff all day long, and you get to do the stuff you want to do all day long, guess what? 
you become a happier person. <laughs> and you're helping the people around you. So I've got this nonprofit in Pakistan, of all places, that I'm sending my son $1,000 over to the small school yesterday. I get, no, I get huge satisfaction out of that. And I'm able to help the people. The people here who work for me make double where they, what they make anywhere else. That's the supreme satisfaction. And I've got more money in the bank than I need, honestly, for my lifestyle. Uh, the satisfaction comes act after fixing the machine, okay? Brilliant. Sam, my next question was, as, as, as small business owners, sometimes we suffer from, <laughs> or suffer from, or we do it to ourselves, procrastination. How can we beat procrastination? Well, let's just go through a typical scenario, and you can go back to those testimonials on the website. But what those people did was uh, they read the book, they got the concept of separate systems, and then they applied it. And I'm, I'm, I try to be very careful about recommending this. If you're going to apply this, this methodology to your business, find a process that can be easily fixed and that you will see results right away. And a perfect place is if you have a business with 10 people in it. And I know a lot of our listeners are Internet people, but, but get, get what I'm saying, Internet people that have one or two people maybe. But if you had a business of 10 people and three people were answering the phone, put them together, find out, among you as the leader and those three people, the best way, discuss it, the best way to answer the phone, and write it down, maybe it's seven steps. Pick, step one, pick up the phone. Step two, say, ABC Company, this is Janice, or whatever you decide to say, on three, four, five, down, down through the whole process. Get everybody to do that every single time, and you will notice an improvement in how your incoming people are uh, their comportment, they'll be happier. And then you take a little bigger process, and maybe now you're going after one that's really problematic. And I talk very specifically in my book about one, uh, how we went through, and there were 53 steps. And I never had to do the process again. And I was spending two hours a week uh, 13 years ago. I, my first 15 years, I spent two hours a week doing this process. I've not, I haven't done it in 13 years. So I've saved two hours a week for the last 13 years. Do the math. It's about a year of 40-hour work weeks. And that process has now been performed perfectly for 13 years as we tweak it and make it a little better every day. So what you want to do to summarize this is you want to find a couple of processes that you can improve relatively quickly. And this one process that I, I haven't done for 13 years took us eight hours of time to fix, eight hours of my time, maybe an hour of two other people's time to help me put this process together. Uh, you find something relatively easy to fix that will have somewhat of a dramatic impact, and now you will not procrastinate. You will now procrastinate because the results are so awesome. And usually what procrastination is, no, I can't do this now. I don't want to do this now because I've got this fire to kill over here. That's really what people are saying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or I've got to recover from my 16-hour my, uh, day yesterday. And pretty soon your hours of the day shorten up, and procrastination just dis dis disappears because you're not living a life of fire killing. There just aren't any more fires to kill, and you're down to a minimal amount of work per week, and you're making a lot of money, and you get excited, and procrastination's just gone. Brilliant. I, yeah. I like the, um, the analogy in your book, Sam, of uh, whack-a-mole. <laughs> you know, whack that's really Perfect. good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> our, our listeners should go to the Google if they don't know what whack-a-mole is and just put it in there, and uh, they'll see that it's just getting better and better and better at killing fires, uh, but they will get you in the end. <laughs> yeah. yeah, a game you can't win. Okay. So my last question, Sam, was should we be aiming for perfection, or does that just hold us back? Yes, we should be aiming for perfection. However, let me redefine perfection. Uh, let's say we are trying to create a process. Uh, there's a lot of steps in it. And it's 98% perfect. What, what, you know, subjectively we call 95, 98% perfect. And in order to get it 100% perfect, we're going to spend a huge amount of time to get that extra 5 or 2% to make it absolutely perfect in this very subjective world. And so I would question whether you can make any process perfect. You, you, perfection is getting it just about almost perfect without wasting time making it too perfect. So in a way, I could answer your question, Joey, by saying 
strive for perfection, but know that if you get to 100% perfection in a colloquial sense or in a classical sense, uh, you've probably spent too much time doing it. And that in itself is imperfection. So we, we allow for mistakes around here. Mistakes happen, but we don't get all bogged down in bureaucracy and uh, going crazy with these processes and getting them just perfect. And that goes for everything, how you ride your bike, your marriage, how you take care of your dog. You know, you, you need to be consistent and congruent, but it doesn't have to be perfect every minute, or you turn into this kind of a person we call a control freak. You don't want to be that. Okay. So you apply like a 98% rule to that, Sam? I like 98%. It feels about right to me. Sure. It, it's, it, uh, if you're in high school or, or college, you get 98% on an exam. You know, you did, you did damn well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't get it perfect, but it was certainly well enough. And uh, maybe getting 100% on every exam would make you a little weird. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Sam, thank you so much for, for doing this interview with me today. It's been absolutely fantastic. For those who, who have listened to this and who do not currently have the book, Sam, where can they get it? Because they, you know, they need it. They, you know, there's more okay. to it than just this. So where can they go? Okay, workthesystem.com is the place to start. Okay. And there's all kinds of resources there. Take a look at the testimonials. Read the uh, front page. There's a little video that I do there. Uh, be sure to look at the FAQs. The FAQs, Joey, kind of sum up everything we've talked about today, and I'm, I'm quite proud of those. I've tweaked those over several years, and I, I think they're really good. Uh, and that website will lead over to the Work the System Academy website. We have an online program, and then we do one-on-one consulting. We have some very large international clients, and we have some very small uh, clients, and we do a coaching too. So under products and services, the tab there, uh, people can look at that. But I've tried to put everything in there. The most important thing, well, that's important, but the second most important thing would to note, to follow directions, you can download the PDF of the entire book, and or the audio of the entire book as recorded by me. Uh, I own the manuscript, and so that's different from 99% of publishing deals. I do have a legitimate publisher. It's not self-published. Uh, so I'm able to do with it what we want. Interesting, Joey, and I mentioned this before, is that I got a, uh, I got a, a wire from a, a, fella, a publishing company in China yesterday, and, and it looks like we're going into China with the book now. So wow. that's pretty cool. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So yeah. people can go straight there, Sam, and they can download the full version for free, uh, uh-huh. a PDF or audio? Yes. Wow. Uh-huh. wow. And it is available in various countries in hard copy, and yeah. it's on an Amazon hard copy. You can buy it off the, the website hard copy. Actually, it's a hardcover book. It's a very nice book. Uh, yes. It makes, it makes a nice gift for somebody who's working 80 hours a week. <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, Sam, there will be links underneath this video and actually on the video itself where people can just go click there and download it. And um, thank you for that. It's, it's an incredible offer, really. If applied, it will, ch- it will change lives. So, Sam, I just want to thank you once again uh, on a personal note for, for spending time with me today and um, sharing this fantastic information with us all. Well, sure, Joey. Love it. It's been my pleasure. I love you. We love you, Brits. <laughs> we love you, Brits. So uh, keep up the good work over there, and, uh, and I'll catch up with you later.